Good evening. This is Lynn Crawford with the Hope Dementia Support Groups. And this evening we have a program about hospice and palliative care when your loved one has dementia. We have a panel of local experts and we will ask them to introduce themselves and tell us where they work. And then we will open it for your questions. So if you will put your questions either in the Q&A or in the chat, then we'll read them and get, get your questions answered. So to start with, we have Mary Buckland. Mary, if you'll introduce yourself. Hello, and thank you uh, for allowing for my participation in this um, program. I'm Mary Buckland. Um, I'm a nurse practitioner. Um, I wear many hats. Um, I'm a palliative care nurse practitioner, practitioner for inpatient at Legacy Health. I also am the founder of a mobile health care providers Northwest which we provide on-site primary um, care and primary palliative care to our patient population here locally at many memory care units and um, other uh, areas of assisted living um, and post-acute. And I'm also a nurse practitioner for community home health and hospice and have been so for the past 10 years. So I wear a multitude of hats, but um, my passion and my love is in, in palliative care and hospice care. And thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. Uh, William Fogelman. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm William Fogelman. I'm a hospice liaison with Community Home Health and Hospice, where we specialize in hospice, palliative care, and general inpatient care as well. Um, we'd be here in the Vancouver area as well as um, multiple areas here, just kind of surrounding the Vancouver area. So I'll be here to kind of help any families with any questions regarding our hospice care program and, and how it can benefit your family during this time. Thank you, William. Oh, you're welcome. Julie Kilter. Hi there, thank you for having me. I am a nurse practitioner with Peace Health Southwest in palliative care. I work in our oncology clinic as well as in our community. We see patients, um, with many different disease processes, including dementia, and also inpatient, we have a program. Thank you. Linda Tang. Hello, I'm Dr. Tang. Um, I'm working at the Vancouver Clinic, which is an outpatient palliative medicine clinic. Um, I also teach advanced care planning for um, the state. I also do facilitation for serious illness um, conversations um, for the state of Washington through WSMA. Thank you for being here. We so appreciate it. And then Sarah Wilson, last but not least, Sarah. Oh, hi, I'm Sarah. I'm a social worker. I work outpatient palliative care. I get to work with Julie Kilzer. And then um, I also work for the hospice team inpatient as a hospital liaison, as a social worker, kind of coordinating and setting up hospice services um, from the hospital setting back to home, um, wherever home is. And we get to work with a lot of folks that have dementia. And so I'm excited to be here today. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for being here. So our very first question is, can you, any one of you tell us the difference between hospice and palliative care? The burning question of the night. So we start with one of our uh, palliative care uh, practitioners. I will take that. <laughs> That's the burning question that a lot of people have. Um, Palliative care um, uh, is, the, the meaning of the word palliate is comfort. And we recognize in pe when people are going through disease processes that many times, they, whether it be an acute disease process, a chronic disease process, or the end of life, many, uh, many of the bumps along that road in that journey are not comfortable. And we do a lot of anticipatory guidance. We do a lot of symptom management we always try to make sure that we keep in mind who that person is as an individual and making sure that the medical team is trying to support and respect um, their care 
as they go on this journey. There is a, there's been this misconception that hospice and palliative care are the same and they are not. We have people that are on, on palliative care for years as we continue to support them through their journey and their healthcare and, and, and managing their disease processes. Hospice is uh, more focused towards the end of life. And we, we generally say that when that person, we think um, with that, in the absence of a crystal ball, that they have less than six months of life expectancy, then that's the time that we talk about hospice and we change the focus of their care to uh, keeping them at home and, and providing the care to them at home or wherever home is. Um, but certainly that palliative care piece follows them through to the end of the life, to, to the end, to the end of their life. Um, and we, we really want to make sure that um, every person that we serve, whether they are in palliative care or on hospice, that we're respecting them as an individual, an individual and what's important to them. And um, keeping in mind that it's not just their disease that we are treating, it's the whole person and all the people that are involved in their care. So, Dr. Tang, is there a difference in the way that um, uh, palliative care is compensated as opposed to hospice? Um, yes, I guess on a technical level. Um, are you asking about the patient side of the finances? Or are you, I, about you know, I, I am, and I'm not sure that that's a fair question to ask you. Um, but I bet that Sarah deals with that on a routine basis, as does William, because they have to explain to people in the hospital how that works. So I, I've got other I, really good questions for you. So we'll we'll go to Sarah Wilson to start with, and then if William has anything to add. Sorry about that. I was gonna say I think it's different for for each person. That's so the nurse practitioner in palliative care can bill for us right now. Medicare Part A. I should just start out and say Medicare Part A pays for hospice care. It's the same thing that pays for someone to go to the hospital. What Medicare says is you cannot have your benefit Part A assigned to hospice and going to the hospital at the same time. So you have to choose one or the other. So when you're signing on to hospice services, you're basically saying that they can care for your Medicare Part A benefit. And so it's a little different for palliative care, for Peace Health, for the outpatient program. Our program currently is free. We are founded, uh, funded through the foundation of Peace Health, and our program doesn't bill right now. We are working, trying to, um, you know, establish billing, and that's been something that they've been working on for a long time. The caveat is that our nurse practitioner is billing, and she is um, new to our team, and that is something that I think um, happens for Dr. Tang and for, you know, Dr. Buckland and for anyone else who's a provider providing that services. And I, I know we're working towards that, um, but right now our outpatient program, if you have our services, we're free. And I don't know if William wants to um, add in anything. Definitely, just going off, you know, uh, what Sarah stated. Um, the majority, and almost every single time, our the insurance that you have will be covering hospice or palliative care one hundred percent. It's very seldomly that we see anybody who has an insurance program that's not going to pay, which is going to cause an out of pocket expense for families. Uh, so, the majority and most of the situations where anybody needs a palliative or a hospice focus of care shouldn't have any out-of-pocket expenses whatsoever to the family. Thank if you. you don't mind, I just wanted to add as far as, as palliative care billing, typically when we see patients, it's like a doctor's visit, so Medicare Part B. Uh, I do like to tell people most don't get a, a bill from palliative care, it usually is covered, but sometimes if it were a beginning of the year situation or a deductible, I don't like to say you'll never get a bill. Uh, but like Sarah said, for our community program, currently we are not billing at all, even for my services um, as a provider. Thank you. So a question that we hear very, very frequently is why would, uh, why would we have palliative care see our loved one with dementia? They're not ready for that. And I don't know when they will be. Can you explain to me when mom will be ready for palliative care or hospice? 
And I would say anybody that would like to answer. I can take a stab at that. Uh, I think in a, in a perfect world, palliative care would be appropriate at diagnosis, uh, particularly with the diagnosis of dementia. There are so many things to think about in, in planning. One thing that I think should be discussed you know, well before diagnosis is, is electing a healthcare power of attorney. Once a person has dementia and as it advances, then that, that's not possible. So kind of preparing ahead of time, I think at diagnosis, just talking to someone who has some knowledge about disease progression and what that looks like would be helpful and perhaps not necessary with early dementia, but maybe just that initial conversation to know that, that dementia is a progressive disease, uh, similar to something like heart disease, uh, lung disease, cancer, and understanding the various stages and, and when it would be appropriate for hospice. And it's, it's usually based on functional status when um, people are no longer able to, to care for themselves and require more and more care as, as disease advances. So I think initially it would be great to have a palliative care consultation at diagnosis and then kind of sporadically throughout disease process to see what, what needs could be met. I will add to that and wonder if the host will let me share my screen. I can show you a graph. Julie, have you done that? I think she just needs to make me like co-host or something and then I can share a graph. That might explain this a little bit better. See if you can. Oh, okay. So hopefully everybody can see that. So okay. this, this schematic um, shows you someone's life uh, time and then their functional status from low to high. And dementia is a, it's like watching grass grow. It's a very slow, progressive, time frame over a person's life um, to the point where you might die of something else um, that's opportunistic um, during the dementia than to actually die of losing your memory. And so the reason why you wanna involve a practitioner or clinician in the palliative medicine space is that window of time, the window of time where the patient is still able to make medical decision makings about their quality of life, such as intubation, feeding tubes, going to the hospital, being on life support, going to a higher level of care, lots of quality of life indicators. You don't want to be asking your family member, loved one who is losing their memory questions that are of that caliber when they're in distress in the hospital or when they don't even remember who you are. So um, I remember very clearly one of my consults was a really beautiful family of like women. And this, this patient was from an era where she wore pearls to like lunch. And there was such a sweet family. And by the time that they had come to see me, they were starting to ask whether mom should go to a higher level of care and whether mom would want a feeding tube, if mom would want to have repetitive admissions to the hospital. And they were super, super gentle with her. And she was a pleasant dementia. She wasn't the drooling, fighting, like she was pleasant and well-groomed. And there was a sadness when they looked at me and they said, I wish we had asked her these questions five years ago. We, we really just want to know what she would say in the truest sense. Um, because she's just so pleasant right now, we, we think she'll just say yes to anything. And so luckily there were three of them and they pieced together what they knew about their mom and what she would want and what she wouldn't want. But it, it forever has been embedded in my mind, the, the phrase, if only we could have asked her five years ago, we would really 
feel better if we knew what her answer was instead of what us three are trying to piece together and make sure that we uh, um, guess correctly. So that's why involving us ahead of time, um, not six days before death, not six months before death, but well in advance to do advanced care planning would be a good idea. So would you say that that uh, um, advanced care planning is important as soon as the diagnosis is made? I would say that the state of Washington and across the nation says advanced care planning needs to start at the moment you're an adult, 18 years and, and up. At 18 years old, you're talking about like, what would happen in a car accident? What would happen if lightning struck me? If, if I had, um, you know, some sort of sporting accident. At 81 years old, you'd be asking, you know, what if I break my hip? What if I have a stroke? What if I have cancer? So 18, 81, advanced care planning has to happen frequently. It has to happen uh, meaningfully. It has to happen as it matches up to where you are in your health and in your life. It should be normalized. It shouldn't just be like, well, I'm 81. I guess it's time to talk about this. Um, it should be as normal as saying, do you have any new allergies on your medicine list? Have you had any new surgery since I last talked to you? It should just be part of the intake. Thank you. So how is the shift from palliative care to hospice generally addressed? I, I think that's, that's the piece where if palliative care can get involved earlier, um, it's that anticipatory guidance piece of, this is where we are now. This is where I anticipate things are going. Do I have a specific timeline? No, but really, really trying to lay that roadmap out of what we are observing, what our concerns are, what we think is around the corner, um, and really um, empowering the patient or their family to understand that these are the things that um, they might be facing so that those decisions can be made um, more proactively that rather than reactively and getting getting a hospice team involved in earlier than later because we know that patients are uh, their symptoms are much uh, better handled and, and controlled and um, that we know that when we have people well palliated or comfortable that we we know that they live actually longer and they live better because their symptoms are controlled. How do you get access to uh, palliative care or to hospice? So it's as simple as a phone call to one of the agencies that provides palliative or hospice. Um, it's never too early or to just contact one of us and, and ask any questions or to even have somebody come out and assess a family member to where they feel that that family member is with their diagnosis and determining, you know, maybe, and that's a lot of what I do in the hospital is, is where is the family at and where is the patient at as far as care goes and what are they doing either to help with the diagnosis or if the diagnosis is no longer something that a, a physician can really help be curative towards, at what point do we move into a palliative and to a hospice focus of care and, and contacting one of us really allows us to get staff on hands with your family and really determine what the next steps based on what the family needs are, based on what the patient needs are to get you moving in the right direction to make sure that quality of life is met with the family and for the patient. So that way everybody's comfortable and prepared for what's to transition in the future and, and making sure that that patient is having a wonderful quality of life while they're at home. And again, it's as simple as just contacting one of, a, one of us to just come in and meet with your family and discuss what good steps would match up with what kind of care you're looking for at that time. Does there have to be a physician's order? There does not. 
that's something that we can work on as far as just gathering information. You're free to contact us and we can gather information and, and go from there. For peace, I'll clarify that a bit. Um, if you want to see a palliative clinician in the outpatient setting or the inpatient setting, you, you do need a referral order. Um, if you want to get information for hospice, that can also be a phone call if you're at home. If you're in the hospital, it's an order. Um, if you want to you know, get connected to bridges or you know, resources or outpatient um, palliative care services that, that isn't a clinic appointment, then you can call the offices of the different um, like legacy Vancouver Clinic Peace Health. Um, I hope that clarified it a little bit because palliative medicine is a specialty. I think of hospice as a team of providers. Um, we, not too long ago, I had a, uh, a family tell me that they very strongly felt that their loved one needed to be on hospice and they got a hospice referral. But when, when, uh, his wife was assessed, he was told that she didn't qualify. And, uh, um, so does that happen? How does it happen? And, uh, obviously he was quite disappointed. I can speak to that a little bit. Um, I'm often setting up hospice services for all of our patients on outpatient palliative care. Something that we do is offer a, a quick transition to hospice. So if your loved one is ready, part of our role is to tell you when someone qualifies. For someone who has dementia and that nothing else, so if they just are um, experiencing dementia and their disease is progressing, Really, they need to be bed bound. They need to be um, having trouble with swallowing. We're going to be seeing some pretty advanced processes taking place. And for dementia only, Medicare looks for people to be really at the end stage of dementia. And so it's possible someone felt like, gosh, my loved one's no longer able to even realize how to sit down in this chair. Um, but really what Medicare is looking for is certain criteria and they guide hospice pretty closely. So they make up all these pretty strict rules. Sometimes when someone has dementia and they have an additional diagnosis, something to do with their heart or another chronic illness that's impacting their, their life and um, may likely, like Dr. Tang was saying, take their life before the dementia does, that qualifies them for hospice. Um, and I wanted to just back up really quick because one thing that Dr. Tang talked about that we are often talking to our patients about who have dementia is the earlier you come on to palliative care, the earlier we can have conversations about um, what would you want for your loved one or what would you want for your life um, if you're at this stage of your dementia and then at this stage of dementia because it looks very different at very different stages. I think the University of Washington has a wonderful advanced care planning document where you can kind of fill it out. If, if something is to happen to me and I'm in the early stages of my dementia, yes, I want these things to be done for me. But if I'm at the end stage of dementia, I don't want A, B, and C done. And so it's a wonderful way to kind of articulate what you want done for you as you kind of progress through the disease process. And if you don't know or have that don't have that support in place, you're not gonna be able to do those kinds of planning. So I'm um, sorry to jump back, but I wanted to bring that up because I think it's a very useful tool. No, I, I appreciate that. The, uh, and it also is an opportunity for uh, uh, Dr. Tang, would you mention the five Ds? I think that's a really useful tool. Yeah, so a good way to um, know when should I do advanced care planning, um, you find yourself um, in some disability way, whether it's a stroke, whether you got a hip fracture, suddenly your ability is disabled. You might want to start talking about like, wow, gee, who's my power of attorney, especially under COVID where they won't let your family into the hospital 
ask Mary Buckland. <laughs> um, someone, your next of kin's being called like every day, multiple times a day. So 18 years old, you know, you could have a car accident. Somebody needs to be your next of kin. So disability decade, every 10 years, every 10 years of your life, if you haven't revised your advanced care planning and figured out if the DPOA is still the same person that you want it to be, uh, you need to revise it and your living will and take a look at it and see if it's all still true. Divorce, obviously, um, especially if you're not legally divorced, then certain state laws say you're still married to that person and the Washington state hierarchy of next of kin says your spouse. Whether that is on paper, whether you're separated, it's your spouse on paper. So having that power of attorney will protect you. So if you get divorced, get separated, you need to look at that and make sure you sign one of those so that there's no conflict of interest. Um, disease progression. Your doctor tells you, hey, your diabetes is worse. Your CHF is worse. Your kidneys are failing. Your cancer died, something disease progression. You need to look at that advanced care planning, um, you know, again. Oh, did I miss another D in there some, somewhere? I'm always missing the last one. Disability or death. If someone you know dies or um, a family member has passed away, it usually sparks some reflection of your own um, mortality and your own um, awareness. And usually you use that as, hmm, this is a springboard. Uh, look what happened to John. Um, I would want that to happen to me or... I never want that to happen to me. And then that starts having people kind of frame things together. i um, saying, you know what? I don't want to be kept as a vegetable. I don't want to be intubated. Um, I don't, I don't want to be fed through a tube like that. I don't want to die in the hospital. I don't want to die alone during COVID. Um, it just starts people thinking about things that they want, things that they don't want and what quality of life is. But I was really um, going to show you the, levels of dementia bouncing off of what um, Sarah and everybody was talking about, but- uh, Perfect timing. I can, I can pause if, if, if there's a different question, but I thought that was a good segue to- No, no, because I think that's a really important thing for people to understand. Okay, so I have two of them. So the first one's more, basic. Um, there's seven levels of dementia. I'm not going to read them. I don't feel that you need to hear my talking head. Um, I like this chart. You can take a photo of this or we can send it out to you um, guys. Um, it, uh, the, the seven degrees of dementia are, are in stages from one to seven. And then um, on the next slide, you'll see that within six and seven, there are even micro stages. And then I think I like this grid because on the left side, it tells you the, the um, severity of that dementia. And so um, what we were talking about in terms of how do you get to hospice, it has to be severe enough. And the level at which you get to hospice is the number seven and the letter C as in cat. And so under 7C, everything before that has to have happened. Losing bowels, losing the ability to hold urine, needing assistance, can't bathe for yourself, speaking very limited to like half a dozen words, um, getting worse in terms of now I can only speak one word. At the level of 7C right here, ambulatory ability is lost. They're not able to really walk on their own. And then anything beyond 7C is, is much worse. But if you can document and show that you got to the level of 7C on a technical basis, you qualify for hospice. Um, with that gentleman and the wife, the caveat, um, and of course, William and Julie and Sarah and uh, Mary can chime in. The caveat is if you're 7C, but within a month, you kind of perk up and you're kind of too healthy, you'll get graduated from hospice because they they don't think that you're going to die within the six months. So that's how people either don't qualify or they qualify for a trial period and then they, they, they come off hospice. Um, I would say dementia is one of the harder diagnoses. 
diagnoses to enter into hospice. I would say that seeking comfort with a diagnosis of cancer gets you into hospice much faster. And, it, and it's an unfortunate thing because I think the caregiving and the burden at this time for dementia patients really, really would benefit from all that hospice can offer. And it's just incredibly challenging. Can one of you describe what would get, um, say, say a person with dementia is hospitalized and uh, uh, they are referred to palliative care? What, what would it be that might commonly cause them to be referred? You know, what would nursing see? What would the, the uh, hospitalist see that would say palliative care needs to see this person? I can maybe comment on that a bit. Uh, a lot of the patients we see in the hospital are coming in for a couple of different reasons. With advanced dementia, one thing that we see quite often is uh, aspiration pneumonia, and that could lead to an ICU admission, perhaps being put on a ventilator, uh, discussion about maybe needing a feeding tube because a, a patient is no longer able to safely eat. Uh, and another thing we see a lot of is sepsis or severe infection from urinary tract infections. So that is commonly a reason that we see these, these patients in the inpatient setting. And one thing to note when, when looking at that, the stages of dementia or that fast scale, uh, a lot of times uh, somebody will be at a certain level, let's say at six, and there is a hospitalization. So it's sort of like a, a stepwise deterioration in, in, in function and ability, and often surprising to families that after a hospitalization, their loved one is not back up to that level where they previously were. So repeated hospitalizations often lead to that deterioration and, and, and commonly not a return to that previous baseline. So sometimes that accelerates things a little bit more. So commonly we see pneumonia and um, and urinary tract infections or sepsis. And, and I think I would add to that, I think the other thing that we get commonly consulted on uh, inpatient is when you have that person with dementia and, and tying into what Julie was saying, we see those things, but the other thing is very um, substantial delirium um, that, can, that can occur and many times when, uh, when they get into that delirious state, uh, many times we know the longer they are on, in that delirium, if we cannot get them out of it, that increases their mortality risk um, up to another 70%. Um, so a lot of times we, the, the medical team, the, the intensive or the internal medicine team is following along and they think they're, you know, they think they're treating the pneumonia or the UTIs for, for Julie's examples, um, but then, then we are we are struck hard and the patient is struck hard and fast with with a delirium that we can't pull them out of. Um, so we see a lot of consultations for that as well. And I think if I can, I think this is the opportunity to also speak of many times with people when they have dementia, the hospital is the last place they need to be. And that's where palliative care and the conversation can be so crucial in preventing really the acceleration of their, of their death, because if they land in the hospital and they get delirious, we know that increases their mortality and that increases pain and suffering. And so that's where palliative care can really be an integral part of having that conversation and saying, what are the things that we can do to keep mom or dad or you know, brother, sister, whomever out of the hospital um, and keep them as highly functioning as possible um, in the community and avoid the hospitalization. And then also, again, that anticipatory guidance piece of, you know, when those opportunistic infections start to occur, that's when the conversation changes. And that's when we talk about symptom management. And we also realize that the disease is progressing. And that is those times that maybe, maybe it is time to talk about hospice, depending where they are on that fast scale and what other comorbid conditions you're dealing with. Great, thank you. If, if your loved one with dementia is not in the home, but is in an adult family home or in a facility or in a memory care, can hospice and palliative care still care for these patients? Uh, 
Yes, definitely. So we can provide care in uh, facilities and, and um, different settings as long as uh, we have the uh, ability to, to take care of them in those facilities and those facilities are allowing us in there. But no matter where the patient is, uh, the majority of time we can work to get hospice care in place in facilities and, and care centers as well. I was going to just chime in and say palliative care goes into the facilities too. Um, where it's one of my favorite things to do um, is going into the facilities. They're getting to work with those folks is pretty awesome. Um, the the facilities that are providing care and specifically memory care units are are doing some amazing work sometimes. And and the people caring for the people in those facilities are amazing employees too. So. Um, we go everywhere, basically wherever you live. So we've um, had homeless patients. We have patients at the shelter. We have patients all over. So does hospice and palliative care help with more than the physical side of care, such as emotional pain, anticipatory grieving, those kind of things? And how, how do they do that? Um, yeah, we are able to help with all of those things. Um, hold on, I'm having some technical issues. My phone's doing something funny. I was having... So yes, we can, we can definitely help with all those different aspects of, of care. It's not just um, servicing the patient and the diagnosis, but it's also everything around uh, the family bereavement, pre-bereavement, making sure that the family understands the diagnosis and what hospice is here to do and the philosophy of us managing symptoms and symptom management, really being there to help the families and patients through the transition that, you know, the patient goes through on hospice. And as that diagnosis, you know, increases and, and, and ends up, you know, kind of taking our family a little bit quicker than we sometimes would like, um, you know, we're really there through all of those steps, not only with nursing, palliative care, um, also helping with CNA hygiene, grooming. Um, we also help with bereavement care, social workers, and spiritual guidance as well. So there's a whole team um, involved with hospice that can really help not only the patient transition through, but help the families understand that transition and be there to support them while, that, while that's happening as well. Thank you. Oh, Dr. Kang says that the best okay. outcome is when the family calls and says, we've observed what you said would happen and we're noticing a lot of changes. We don't think going to the hospital will make uh, major quality of life changes for our family member and we're ready for hospice. That would be the ideal, wouldn't it? And does that happen, Dr. Kang? Yeah, the, the ideal, I'm not saying the ideal is that your family member is dying. The ideal is that it's on your terms. It's that we're not telling you it's time, you're in the hospital and we say, look, there's nothing more we can do, you gotta go. It's ideal because you're at home, you're not in chaos, you're right where you're supposed to be, you're with the people you're supposed to be and you call and it's your family coming to that space and then calling us and saying, we need help. We think it's time to transition. And on our side, we can flurry. <laughs> we can get all the faxing done. When you do it in the hospital, I just feel like, I think Mary will take care of you really well. I just think when you're in the hospital, the movement, the distress, the transition from one place to another place for comfort, I just think, why? Why can't I just be in my pajamas and then you call hospice and then hospice comes to my house? I just think that, families have been more relieved when they when they pick up the phone and call me and say, we think it's time. It doesn't have to be this hour. You have a day or two. And that's when I will get it done that hour. But then I don't feel like everything's hitting the fan. I feel like, all right, the person is where they need to be. They're comforted. I can send some medications over and let me do all the paperwork and the faxing and then the phone calls to get hospice to come into your house. And usually, I don't know, when I call, I, I feel like I can get people to hospice within 24 to 48 hours. 
I don't ever want to have to be on emergency. I want families to say, um, you have a couple of days, like nothing's happening right now. But I just always thought that death should be um, dignified, peaceful, calm, not suffering, not chaotic, not with beeps and whistles and people that you don't know coming into your room. It should just be falling asleep and being peaceful. I have a, a question. Um, do both hospice and palliative care address the needs of the caregiver or the care partner as well as the patient? And how do they do that? I, I have to say, absolutely. That's really the, the definition of palliative care. Um, particularly at Peace Health, I have to say our social work team is phenomenal, just really evaluating family needs and providing necessary resources, particularly with dementia, all of the caregiving necessary and, and other things in the community that families don't even know about. It's, it's like our social workers are anticipating the next move and, and what they will be needing. Uh, as well as bereavement and, and things like that. And I know uh, hospice does a wonderful job with that too. So it's really about the, the whole family. It's not just about the patient. I have a question related to hospice recertification. It says how frequently is hospice recertified? When is the patient evaluated to see if they still need hospice? I think somebody had mentioned that, that they get better and they graduate. Um, hospice works in 90 day um, increments for the first two benefit periods. And then hospice evaluates every 60 days. Um, so patient is recertified the, uh, the first three months and then again, the, set, uh, the three month period and then it goes to two month periods. Thank you. Um, I think DPOA was mentioned. Can you explain what that is? Durable I can power take, of attorney. Uh, I can take that. So your DPOA is your voice when you don't have one, whether you um, are cognizantly not uh, unaware in this case in dementia, if you're at the point that you don't have capacity to, to make um, meaningful, insightful decisions any longer. Your DPOA is, is the person that is your voice to help guide your medical care. Um, and then of course there's the medical, medical power of attorney and then there's the financial. Um, and so some people will have one person be their medical, one person will be their financial. Um, but that is somebody that you designate ideally um, as to you know will uphold your wishes um, and really work with um, your medical team to make sure that um, your wishes are known and that the medical need, medical team um, knows what that path is going to look like. Uh, but it only goes into effect when you have no voice. So what happens if, um, if they haven't had the um, foresight to um, select a power of attorney for healthcare? That can be that can be a little tricky and sticky. Um, so uh, the Washington state of Washington has a, a medical decision making tree when it comes to medical decision making, and um, uh, it, it it outlines you know first it goes to spouse and then um, then it can go to uh, to children then it can it goes to and correct me if I'm wrong you guys because I don't have it in front of me then it can go to adult children. Um, and then it branches out and it even has, if we have some people that don't have any family and it goes to somebody that just sh is showing interest and care in this person. Um, uh, I will tell you though, having been entrenched in some very difficult discussions over the years, uh, it's always best to have that person selected because if you, if you have any, it's a stressful time, it's an emotional time. And if you have five children that all have different viewpoints, um, many times um, that person in the bed is lying there languishing because no decisions can be made. Um, and in the state of Washington, if, it, if you're at the decision tree where it has to be all of your children, it, it, you, it has to be all of your children coming to a mutual agreement 
um, together. And I will tell you that is that can be very, very difficult, very difficult when you layer in emotions and grief and everything that goes along with that. Just imagine trying to agree in a conversation at Thanksgiving and then to have a discussion like this. So, and um, uh, we do have the, the Washington law that, uh, do you have a slide of this, Dr. Tang? I think you're muted. Yes, I can show you a slide. And I, I will send that out if people are interested. I imagine they would be. Um, the new law, the revised laws includes grandchildren uh, at this point. Um, so after adult brothers and sisters of the patient, they have included another line for grandchildren. And in the hospital, they'll go down the tree and call every warm body until they have to call the court for a guardian. The guardian should be like the very last resort. And I think this can get sticky when you have warm bodies, but nobody wants to step up because maybe you've pissed them off and they don't want to be your power of attorney. Um, and that has happened. Um, I've had four warm bodies, nobody steps up, we've got a guardian. And that is really unfortunate. The patient definitely was middle to entering stages of like dementia where there was no more capacity. And I thought it was just somewhat ludicrous that I, I know that there is family. I know there's children. I know there are friends and nobody stepped up. And so the hospitals had to order a guardian ad litem. And, and um, just adding on to that too. Now I will tell you that the law state, the laws are changing in the state of Washington, but if you get into that guardian ad litem piece, that guardian ad litem has no zero medical decision-making ability. So again, that person is lying in the bed languishing uh, while we were trying to get all of these pieces into place. And with the state of, the, with COVID being right now, the courts are working at the, the quickest rate they can but they are backlogged as well. And then getting a guardian in place, sometimes this can take weeks again. And then you have this person that, that is lying there and we, the medical team doesn't know which way to go. And many times we are doing things to that person that aren't pleasant and they really, um, really aren't changing what's going on under the surface for this person. So an important thing to do is to establish a durable power of attorney for health care as a very early thing. Is that what I'm hearing? I'm screaming, screaming it from the rooftops, Lynn. Perfect. So um, I have a question about typical or common kinds of issues that palliative care practitioners hear from families dealing with dementia. I think one thing that we see quite often is just behavioral disturbance, agitation, um, hallucinating and things like that. And it can be very difficult. It's never the, the first thing we want to do is to medicate the patients, but sometimes that that is the only way. We try to use different techniques like redirecting, but it can be very challenging for families that have to provide this 24 seven care and um, just find it really difficult to deal with these behaviors that they've not seen before. Okay. Anything else? I was gonna say that um, we're, we're dealing with a lot of anticipatory grief um, from a social work standpoint. We're working with family members who are watching someone pass away in front of them, but they're still with us. So it's, it's a process that most people have a, a lot of trouble with and they benefit from support. Um, having bereavement support is really important. Um, it is anticip anticipatory grief. You are um, really going through the stages of grief um, and it can be a really challenging thing to not have support. 
And um, a lot of times people, especially spouses of a loved one who go through that process really ben benefit from having someone to talk to and normalize things with because it can it can be really jarring to have your loved ones screaming at you or accusing you of things that didn't happen or um, really saying some really nasty things like their behavior changes in such a way that you've never seen your loved one like that before. So it, um, you know, dealing with some of the emotional distress as someone declines cognitively is something that we work on a lot. Sometimes you see the family members of people with dementia uh, deteriorate on their own, that their physical health is uh, clearly undergoing uh, uh, negative changes. Is, do you ever make recommendations for placement? I, uh, I, I have said this so many times as, as I'm having conferences with different, different people. And, you know, there's, and I'm, I'm sure there everybody else on this panel has seen it too. The person who is the caregiver looks worse than the person that they're caregiving for. And caregiver fatigue is a real thing. And there have also been studies that show that caregivers alone can shorten their life expectancy if they're not meeting their body's own needs. And yes, there are times that, you, you know, you have to sit across the table, you know, and hold the hand of this person and say, you've got to have help or we're going to be putting you in the ground first before your loved one that you're caring for. And that's a very difficult conversation to have, but it's, it's very necessary. Um, and, um, and really, you know, uh, opening, opening up to them about your concerns um, about, you know, where this is going for them and, and trying to tap them into the resources. And I, I truly agree with Julie uh, wholeheartedly you know, get in touch with your local friendly, good, warm um, um, hearted social worker and have them help you get this person some help because, because you're gonna lose that caregiver um, sometimes quicker than the person that they're, than they're caregiving for. I've also found Mary that a lot of times caregivers are not doing things like colonoscopies and mammograms and routine visits. They're just completely ignoring their own health because they don't have time. They, they can't leave their loved one home alone because of safety issues. So it's, it's a huge issue when the caregiver gets sick, then what? So I, I like to have that conversation too, where that self-care has to be priority for the caregiver. And in working with hospice, one part of our programs is also that we do offer respite periods for the patients. Um, so that way the caregiver, we can help decrease caregiver burnout and, and help with that and, and place the patient in, a, in one of our hospice houses or a facility for a period of time up to five days just to give family members time for themselves or if any emergencies come up. So you don't have to worry about your loved one or having to figure out how you're going to be able to leave, take care of your loved one because you have other things to tend to. So that's one of the benefits of the hospice as well is just really focusing on not only patient care, again, taking care of families is, is one of our priorities as well. How often can you uh, request those five days of, of uh, respite? For Peace Health, you can request it once every benefit period with some exceptions. So you'd be able to get five respite days at our um, hospice house for every benefit period. So the first 90 days, five days and beyond. We've had a lot of people um, using the services. So sometimes the respite can take place in a skilled nursing facility, um, especially when they're Cowlitz County patients. So that's been another way they've accessed it. Is there an issue with uh, being able to take patients with dementia, with behavioral issues for respite? Yes, if you're walking around and you're going to be an escape artist, they're gonna have a difficult time taking you. Um, that should be noted. I don't want people thinking that, that they can access that without, um, without having the patient be more calm and easily managed. So, um, you know, it's, 
it can be a challenging thing. But really with the support of the hospice team, we're not gonna be seeing delirium like you would in a setting like palliative care because we're not checking in as often. The hospice team is going out to patients' homes maybe twice a week. And so delirium is much better managed. Additionally, the nurses and, and the whole team gets training on delirium. So patients are sleeping a lot better. They're, they're better, um, their delirium is better managed. And so ideally they would be able to qualify for going to respite if they were being supported by the hospice team. And, you know, just working with a family and working with your hospice team with medication and med management is really an important part of making sure that your family member has that quality of life and is able to access these types of uh, services as well. It's really working together and, and hospice isn't there to take over your household. We're really there to support everybody as a family. So a lot of times people have an outlook that hospice and palliative are gonna come in and take over and tell you what to do. And that's not the case at all. We're really there to work together with your family to come up with a good care plan. And again, work as a team and put a team effort to make sure your family member is taken care of and your family as well. You had mentioned that that um, um, you sort of discourage people with dementia from being in the hospital. Can you speak to that a little bit more? And one of the things that we we talk about frequently is uh, um, mom has fairly severe dementia, but she's still getting her injections in her eyes for macular degeneration. Um, needs to have a routine um, colonoscopy, things like that. I guess, Dr. Tang, I, I, I'm staring at you thinking about um, when do we stop doing those kind of things? Do you have to be on palliative care? Do you have to be on hospice? Is it common sense? I think it depends on the stage. Of, of the dementia, and then what is the goal? If we're gonna get a colonoscopy, what is the goal? Because colonoscopies are usually to look for something or to prevent something from happening. And so if you're looking for something with the intention that you will go to the whole nine yards, if you find a tumor, for example, and you're going to do something about it, then you should get the colonoscopy. If the person's mildly cognitively impaired, but isn't so far down dementia, they've got years, they've got quality of life. I would never discourage anyone to live longer so long as the quality of life is there. And quality of life has to be in alignment with your goals with your lifestyle, not my quality of life, your quality of life. And so I would do that colonoscopy. If someone is like a stage six, stage seven, I don't see why subjecting that person to a colonoscopy only to find a cancer. And now you're not going to do anything about it. So why did you do the test? If, if, if it doesn't change what you ultimately are going to do with your goals, and it doesn't improve your quality of life or your overall um, longevity, because you're not going to get treated, then you've just put somebody under anesthesia to get a colonoscopy because the algorithm told you to. And I would love to know that all of our clinicians don't just follow algorithms. We follow what patients and their families want. We explore what really is meaningful. So it's not a one answer um, kind of question. That's why it takes time to talk to a palliative care team, uh, and when I say it takes time, you sit down with them and you say, where are we? Where do you think you are? Where do you think this is going? Where do you think her current quality of life is? Um, is there something that you need to get to? Uh, are there short-term goals? Are there long-term goals? And then that frames the answer to a mammogram, a colonoscopy, a biopsy, blood transfusion, dialysis, so many questions. And even if I could give you a survey of like the top 100 advanced care planning questions for dementia patients, I wouldn't exhaust what Mary Bucklin or Julie could ask you in the hospital. And so that's why 
the earlier you are in the beginning of the process where the family member is awake, alert, not in distress, not in delirious state, you could ask them, hey, if you can't play bridge anymore or you can't play golf or the idea of being in a hospital where you're alone because we can't be there with you under COVID, if that really rubs you wrong, you have your answer right there. You have your answer that we're not going to subject that family member to that kind of care because they're already telling you that that level of quality of life is a no-go for them at 98, at 81, whatever that age is, whatever, whatever it is. It's, it's advanced care is not age related. It's like, what am I willing to go through for more time? What am I willing to go through? If I find something, will I do something about it? So talk to your PCP. If your PCP isn't able to guide you in these types of conversations, ask for a geriatrician, ask for a palliative care person. Um, I would love to think that we all can have these conversations, but those are the three that I'm thinking of. Um, a neurologist um, usually also is involved if the severity of that dementia is, is present. And if you're not getting the guided conversation, then you, you might need to be talking to palliative care. So is it palliative care in both in inpatient and outpatient settings? Is it palliative care that, that helps families with the conversations and to complete the powers of attorney and, uh, and healthcare directives? Is, is that part of what palliative care does? Uh, For me, yes. yes. It's oh, a big, part, big part. <laughs> so Go ahead, Julie, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say that's really the, every new consult that I have, that's something I discuss. Do you, do you have a, a healthcare power of attorney? Have you thought about these things and provide them with documentation? Uh, in the outpatient setting, we typically have the gift of time. So I can say, you know, take this home, read it over. We'll talk about it next time. Um, but we definitely encourage patients and families to, to do these things early in the process. And it's, it's really part of every conversation for me. Um, question about uh, frequent UTIs and other things that takes people to the uh, uh, emergency room. Are these things that can be dealt with without taking that person to the emergency room? It depends. Um, it depends on your primary doctor. Um, some primary doctors um, or clinicians will have a comfort level of standing orders. Go get your urine tested. Um, is there a fever? Are vital signs okay? Um, here's some prophylactic antibiotics until we get cultures. Um, I think when you're at that point, it's, it's a lot of risk on the clinician side to say, I'm going to do these things without laying eyes on you or a video visit or touching you. I, I know that your history is this keeps on happening. I know your cultures, it's, it's a clinical judgment question. And so I cannot give you an algorithm question. Some clinicians will never do that. They have to see you, they have to have some sort of interface. Everybody has a certain level of comfort that they're willing to take as a risk. Um, so that's part one of the answer. The other part is, how often are we having these urinary tract infections? Because one of those times will lead to sepsis. And one of those times, if it, if it leads to sepsis, there is no amount of outpatient that's gonna help you get out of sepsis. You need to go to the hospital and see Mary. You need to go to the hospital and see Julie. The fear I have is if you, if your family member has recurrent UTIs and it leads to sepsis, that is a huge functional hit to, to your loved one and the dementia gets worse. 
when you put a dementia patient into a facility setting or just you're changing the environment, it causes delirium. It, it, the, it's like through the roof, like high risk for delirium and altered mental status. Combined with the fact that you can't be there at the bedside because it's COVID. So think about all the distress of recurrent UTIs leading up to sepsis. And that's why these goals of care conversations have to happen. We can try to treat them outpatient, but if they are really recurrent and the patient's being colonized, then at any one of those occurrences, it can turn a dime and turn into more severe systemic infection, which then will um, beg the decision to go to the ER. That's not a place where you can call me and say, I think she has sepsis and we want to go to hospice. I would never agree to that because I, there's no way I could get you hospice within an hour. That's really, if you're, if the patient really is that sick, you're going to the ER. And the messy part of that is you could go from the ER to hospice. You go to the ER, get admitted, see palliative care, go to hospice. Or the gamble is you go to the ER, you go to the hospital, you get better. And then you come home. I don't know, Mary, I don't know, Julie, but it's risky. And so if I'm seeing somebody who has recurrent UTIs, the one part is, okay, we can give you antibiotics, we can do some urine samples, we can do it only so far, but my spider senses start to like tingle. And I know I have to have that conversation with you sooner or later, or else you're gonna get sent to Julie and Mary in the hospital. And then we're all praying that you make it and go home. We don't want you to die in the hospital. I have to agree, this is a, a common problem and I am often asked if I will just prescribe antibiotics because this is what my loved one had last time and that worked and you can only do this so many times before sepsis sets in and it really is about a goals of care conversation and respecting patient wishes and not doing aggressive interventions. I, I had a patient in an adult family home and the caregiver there was constantly wanting me to order straight cats to, to obtain a urine sample through a catheter, which is very painful, which can actually cause infection and, and other complications. So really having those conversations earlier with family saying, you know, is this really what your loved one would want? And, and where are we going with this? So for nearly two years now, we've been dealing with COVID and with parking people in the hospital and not allowing anyone to be with them. And I do know that it's better now than it has been in the past. Um, but have you found issues with that? With the inability of families to be with that individual who has dementia? Has that created issues for you? I, I would say, yes, it does. Our patients who have dementia do better with someone that they recognize and often with that caregiver that is their person. So when we separate them, it, it causes a lot of challenges and it makes people, um, you know, really feel anxious and they're not, they're not supported. And I think I just want to explain what it looks like for someone who has delirium in the hospital, because sometimes people don't realize that when someone's, you know, ha who has dementia goes into the hospital, we sometimes have to actually use soft restraints on them um, and tie them to the bed. And, and that's not something I can think of very many people being okay with or wanting for their, for their care. And, and so I think just understanding what that looks like, and, and I, I hate to be so blunt, but I wanna just be very clear that that does happen because people are, could harm themselves um, and they have or have harmed other people trying to care for them. And so it's something that's really challenging for the staff, but it's also made so much worse with, with COVID and, and we're definitely challenged by a lot of things and it is getting better. People are able to be with their loved ones, but it's, it's definitely created a lot of challenges.
Yeah, and I think I think the thing that that we hear so much, and it, it's it, we are relaying what we are seeing through our lens, through our eyes, our lens. But we are we you know we are trying to t- paint a picture of what is going on with their loved one. But there is something to be said that a picture paints a thousand words, and when I, I found that taking families on this journey, it's, it's much longer. It's, 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 it's harder. It's not understood because they aren't there at the bedside, seeing their loved one going through everything that we are explaining to them. Um, and also the, the grief that goes along with that. I think it, it adds a whole extra layer of, of complicated grief on top of complicated grief when they know their person that they love is 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 having you know is experiencing this this decline they're very sick um and their medical team is telling them these things so they're anticipating the loss of someone and then they're grieving the fact that they can't be with them so it really has changed the conversation to uh, uh, uh that we have with families to something that it does not feel humane many times um, and, and really trying to find those words to really, you know, connect with people via zoom, you know, via the phone, if, you know, if they're, if, you know, if they're calling in, in um, wanting to do FaceTime where the nurses, if they have time are going in and, you know, using the phone so they can see their loved one. Um, it, it really has changed the face of how we are doing palliative care, um, in inpatient medicine for sure. Thanks, Mary. So we're we're uh, getting close toward the end, and one of the things that uh, we always like to ask panels, nothing like putting you on the spot, but uh, for each one of you, is there something that you would like our audience to consider, keeping in mind that that most of the folks that attend these have loved ones with dementia. And is there something that you'd like them to consider or do or know? And anyone can start. I won't put anybody on the spot. Uh, I can start. I, I sometimes like to, you know, a lot of our, our patients and families don't do that advanced care planning as of course recommended. So by the time the diagnosis of dementia comes and and the disease advances, a lot of times, particularly with the hospitalization, the family will say, well, I I don't know what, you know, my wife would want in this situation. And and I I like to say, maybe think about 10 years ago, you're you're sitting at the kitchen table, having breakfast, a normal conversation and and ask, ask your wife at that time, if this is her condition, she's like Sarah said, tied to a bed, agitated, having delirium, what, what types of interventions would she want and what types of uh, life prolonging interventions and aggressive measures would she want? And I think that sometimes it's difficult to see our loved ones like that, but trying to, to go back in time and ask yourself that question, I think kind of helps put it into perspective, at least for me. Thank you. I'll go next. Um, I often think about, um, okay, so two things. Uh, Bridging off of Julie, um, I think the best advice my non-palliative care (laughs) physician husband said is, um, if you don't make a decision, somebody else will make one for you. And so that's been my like, okay, people, let's do advanced care planning. <laughs> I don't like to be told what to do. So I'm like, okay, fine. I will make my own decisions. Um, the takeaway I'd like for the audience, because um, I'm imagining that the audience is an audience of caregivers, um, please take care of yourself. You have to be the best version of yourself um, so that if things go down, Uh, you're ready. If you don't take a break, if you don't do your regular checkups, if you don't have respite, if you don't take care of yourself, dementia progresses over time. It gets harder over time. And if your loved one has to go to the hospital or needs you that much more later on, 
and you're depleted, you won't be able to show up. And that's the reason why you do need to take care of yourself now, not later, because it's going to be challenging later. So you have to kind of have that battery and have that reserve. Um, and you'll, you'll be better equipped to support your loved one at the moment they need you the most, not just right now with the caregiving, the toileting, and the um, ADLs, and the day-to-day. That's all good, but if you could spread some of that out and get some respite for yourself, we want you to be at your best when it really matters. Thank you. So I'll go ahead and go next. Um, one thing that I've always uh, seen working in hospice is uh, a term that I've, I, I've really worked into my philosophy is hospice sooner. Um, I don't want people to think that you call hospice and oh no, they might not qualify, that's a bad thing, because it's not. If somebody doesn't qualify for hospice, there's nothing wrong with that. But really reaching out and getting a perspective of where your family member is at in their diagnosis if a hospice um, nurse, RN uh, physician says, oh, they're not where they're, they need to be on hospice, you've now built that bridge and you have access to a team, even if you're not on our services, to really be there to help guide you through this process and this transition and help lead you into different directions. And it's okay to ask for that type of help. We're here to support you. We're here to support a family. Whether or not you're on hospice care with us, does not matter. It's really about making sure our community is taken care of and really being there for all of you to kind of help direct you and best that we can. When we meet with a patient and family, now we have an idea. We have a synopsis of where you all are at as a family and what your needs might be and what we can do to meet those goals. So really just understanding that we're here to help and there's nothing wrong with reaching out to us and there's nothing wrong with not being ready for hospice at this time, but at least having the knowledge of how we work and what we can do to help. Thank you. I can go next. Um, I, of course, am the social worker of the group. Um, so I'm going to just let everyone know that we have a caregiver shortage in Clark County. So if you were thinking you wanted to some respite and you might have some money to pay for a caregiver, there isn't a lot of caregivers right now for our population of growing people that need support. So um, if you're ever even considering it, I would start the process sooner rather than later. We're Running people can't get a caregiver when they need them, and often I hear people say, "Well, we have," um, and and those folks are that we're having a shortage of things, uh, supplies as well, hospital beds. Um, we're having a national shortage on um, oxygen, so just some things going on, just to be aware of um, and to be proactive if you can. And then a shout out to Peace Health Outpatient Palliative Care. If you think your loved one would benefit from our program, definitely give us a call. We're open um, to taking referrals and love meeting uh, folks that we can support in the community. So, thank you. Um, I I think the thing the the word of advice that I would have um, or direction, if you will, I think telling t giving the caregivers and the family permission that it is okay to say no, and what I mean by that is. Um, if you do land in the hospital and you do have a medical team thrusting all kinds of information on you and offering all kinds of interventions and tests and all of that, if you know that this goes against what this person would want, you know it's against their wishes. Even though you have medical professionals putting this information in front of you, please know that you are empowered to say no and that enough's enough and you want a different route of support, a different means of support, and you different, want a different approach to their care. And it, it's okay to say no. Thanks, Mary. 
I like that idea of empowerment because people honestly feel that they don't have it. There, there still is a, uh, a medical professional still have uh, quite the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. um, so I believe, unless you all have something else, I, I put it out. If anyone else wants to ask more questions, they are welcome to. This has been hugely helpful. I really appreciate it. I am very excited to see how palliative care is growing in Vancouver. Um, so thank you all, because I think that it's just uh, incredibly important. Um, I guess the one thing that, that I, I would like to know, without putting anybody on the spot, is um, if I had a diagnosis of dementia and I uh, uh, wanted to to complete a uh, advanced directive, uh, would it be appropriate for me to to wish to have full resuscitation? I think that depends on. Um, not just dementia, but your overall trajectory and history. If you have good quality of life, good functioning, good heart, good lungs, and there's really nothing going on except mild cognitive decline and your quality of life is acceptable to you, then I would say that I wouldn't, I wouldn't discourage you from treatment. I wouldn't discourage you from being full code. You have to accept what resuscitation means. You're not going to get up and walk out of the hospital. If, if you're at a point of resuscitation, your ribs will be broken. You'll be in the ICU. You'll be intubated. You'll have to go to rehab afterwards. Um, and then there's the delirium of like being in the hospital if you're 65 and older. So that's pretty rare. If you're quite demented and you have heart disease and you have lung disease, yada, 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 then you have to ask, what am I going to be like after they resuscitate me? Because if I'm going to be worse off than I am right now, you have to ask yourself, do I want to return to a life worse than where I am right now. And if the answer is no, that's your answer. Because an event that causes resuscitation is an act of God that stopped your breathing, stopped your heartbeat, and you're asking the medical professionals to bring it all back, which means it's an act of God to bring it all back. We have to put you on a machine. We have to do everything to bring those things back. And that comes at a cost. That comes at a cost of functionality and quality of life. And so if you're not good to begin with, and then something bad happens to you, then you're not so great off afterwards. You may come back alive, but it cannot guarantee you what that quality of alive is. And so that's why this advanced care planning, this conversation about uh, pulse is what I'm hearing. You need to have a heart to heart talk with a practitioner and your family because once you're in the ICU, you get a feeding tube. It's, it's not because you don't have good nutrition. It's just when you are intubated, you don't eat. So it comes with the whole package. And so you have to really, really think about that. That is a really good question at the end of a, <laughs> of a talk. Sorry about that. But you know, these are things that, think, that people think about. And uh, uh, and we have heard people with a uh, an early dementia diagnosis saying that well I have dementia I know what's coming and it's not worth living but I can't make the decision for death with dignity now is that ever going to change you know looking at the dementia directive. And you can say, if I was like this, I wouldn't want this. But you can't say, I want to end. 
And those are esoteric conversations, but they're conversations that happen. Probably among medical professionals, but nevertheless. So, well, thank you all very much. I think that was hugely helpful. I think people understand a little bit better um, uh, why they would want their loved one with dementia on palliative care and then on to hospice. And they now know where to get it. So I appreciate it so much. Everyone have wonderful holidays. Um, we will uh, have the, the video up on Facebook and on our YouTube channel within a couple of days. And I do have some uh, materials that I will send out by email. So thank you panelists so much. Thank you so much. You have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much.